This is not what I was expecting from the band Los Lobos. Well, don't worry, baby. What's the world is free. Well, don't worry, baby. I mean, this is like incredible blues. It's Don't Worry Baby by Los Lobos off of their 1984 album, How Will the Wolf Survive? It's also number 455 out of 500 on the Spotify original, The 500, with me, Josh Adam Myers, a.k.a. The King of Fleece. What's up, Fleece Army? If you haven't gotten a ranking yet in the Fleece Army, because I've been doing that on social media, people like hit me up and I'm like, you're a captain, you're a general. Hit me up on Soch. Let me know that you're listening to the 500 and you're you're a part of the Fleece Army and I will give you your ranking. Because when you're in the Fleece Army, you're joining me on this journey through Rolling Stone Magazine's list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. And I mean it, man. This is the greatest recorded music in the history of the world. So get your ranking. Football has started, so I know it's difficult sometimes to listen to these records, but do it. Why, when you're watching your team shit the bed and you're losing the house on the bet that you made on sportsbookie.com, you know, put this soundtrack on. Let it play in the background. It's fine. September 27th, guys, we're doing a live 500 recording at Just for Laughs Toronto. I'll be in Toronto. I'm so excited. I've never been there before. Uh, but come and join me, man. Tickets are at my website at www.joshadammyers.com. There's the link that'll take you to the Just for Laughs page or just go to hahaha.com and you can get tickets. JFL Montreal was so much fun. They're having me back because it's only getting bigger because of all of you guys doing the Instagram stories. You didn't think I was going to promote this this week, but I did. Instagram stories, guys, take a screenshot of how you're listening to the 500 and tag me at Josh Adam Myers and put a hashtag the 500 podcast because we are trying to get the word out and I know my Felice Army knows people. Give us that 24 hour ad on your social media and I will love you forever. Now, like I said at the beginning, I didn't know what to expect from this record. I didn't know much about Los Lobos. So here we go. Released in October of 1984 and produced by T-Bone Burnett and Steve Berlin. How Will the Wolf Survive is the second full-length album by the Chicano rock group Los Lobos, who, on their first album, modestly referred to themselves as just another band from East L.A. The roots of Los Lobos began in East Los Angeles in 1973 by Garfield High School student, vocalist-guitarist Cesar Rosas, and his slightly older neighbor vocalist and multi-instrumentalist Francisco Frank Gonzalez who was interested in Mexican folk music. They were soon joined by drummer, multi-instrumentalist Louis Perez, guitarist vocalist David Hidalgo, and bassist Conrad Lozano, all former students of Garfield High as well. They founded the group as Los Lobos del Este de Los Angeles, the Wolves of East Los Angeles. Although they had all played in top 40 cover bands, they wanted this band to reflect the heritage of their Mexican folk roots. For authenticity, they all learned to play additional traditional Mexican instruments. I can't believe Morty would put those two words together in this thing. Why would you put additional traditional? Do you understand how hard that was, people, for me to say? After an argument, Gonzalez left the band in 1976. Why? Why would he leave? A year later, in 1977, Los Lobos del Este recorded their debut album as an acoustic folk group and gained some popularity within their community. However, after playing with a lot of other local punk-influenced bands like X, Circle Jerks, and especially The Blasters, they wanted to get heavier and reach larger audiences. So they mixed their traditional Mexican music with Zydeco, R&B, soul, Tex-Mex, folk, country, and rock and roll. The EP that followed in 1983, titled And A Time To Dance, saw them shorten their name, partner up with producers T-Bone Burnett and former Blasters member Steve Berlin, record a cover of the Richie Valens hit Come On Let's Go, and eventually, this is really cool, eventually win the first, the first Grammy Award for Best Mexican-American Performance for the song Anselma. That's awesome. 
Besides being a critical success, it allowed them to buy a Dodge van and tour the U.S. for the first time. They returned to the studio in the summer of 1984 to record their major label debut for Warner Brother Records. Once again, produced by T-Bone and Steve Berlin, who had previously played woodwinds on their EP, they officially added Steve as a member on this album. The white and Jewish Berlin was the only non-Latino in the band. Can you imagine what that would have been like? Hey guys, I, I can't play next week, it's Purim. What the fuck is Purim, Holmes? I mean, it's, I don't even really know what it is. I just know I, I got to go to shul. What the fuck is shul, man? What is that circle on your head? I don't know why. What is that, a yamulka? What the fuck is a yamulka? Is that racist? I can say it. I'm Jewish. The album was another critical success. Though it only peaked at number 47 on the Billboard charts, it stayed on for 34 weeks and cemented their popularity. A few years later, they would record more Richie Valen songs for the 1987 biopic movie La Bamba, whose title track would go on to go to number one and make them popular worldwide. Well, they deserve it because this is a great record. And I've got a great guest whose popularity is going to hit worldwide popularity. My friend Frankie Quinones, a great stand-up comedian, but man, his character work is top-notch. One of my personal favorites is Cholo Fit, where he plays the character Creeper, and he teaches other Cholos how to work out. It is extremely funny, and you can see it on his social media. Maybe you've seen him in the Dress Up Gang, which premiered at Sundance. Maybe you've heard his voice on Victor and Valentino on Cartoon Network. I've been looking for an album to sit down and talk to him with, and when I saw this one pop up, I threw the Hail Mary hoping he was a fan of Los Lobos, and the dude was like, dude, I love that band. So I was like, yes. Rate, review, and most importantly, subscribe to The 500 and listen free on Spotify or anywhere you get your podcast, but listen to it on Spotify. Follow me at Josh Adam Myers on all social media. Email the podcast at 500 podcast at gmail.com to tell us if we're doing a good job and tell us if you don't like my opinion or you love my opinion. And for all things 500, guys, go to the website, the500podcast.com. Well, now that I've gotten through all the mishmash, nothing left to say, but here we go with number 455 out of five, honey, with How Will the Wolf Survive by Los Lobos. Frankie Quinones, Frankie Quinones, Thanks for not jumping, uh, jumping in on that, dude. I really, yeah. <laughs> I just, I feel like, like such an idiot every thing, time yeah. I do that. <laughs> so are you? So, so I asked you to do this because I'm a huge fan of yours. Uh, but you said you were a fan of Los Lobos. Like, oh yeah. How did that sure, start? Man. Like, to be honest, I mean, uh, there's a obviously a famous, famous movie called La Bamba. That, oh, uh, that's how I knew him. Oh, really? Okay, Dude, perfect. Every, yeah. Everybody knew La Bamba. Everybody when when that came out, Lou Diamond Phillips. Come on. Yeah. Well, you know, some of my family members knew about him before, and I guess you know, because they're they're from East LA. But uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know, obviously when Obama came out, we all, I mean, a lot of a lot of people fell in love with that from every background stuff like that. But that's when I first saw, you know, when you saw Richie get the inspiration, and when he was in TJ, and then you saw Los Lobos playing on stage, and then I was like, who are these guys? He looked them up, and they had already been putting music out, you know, like since. I don't know. I think before the eighties. Like well, this came out in eighty four. Yeah, so that came. But out. This is their second record. Yeah, so yeah. I was probably you know I was thinking I was already like three or four years old at that time. So obviously, I didn't I didn't know who they were until yeah until until La Bamba came out. And then I started just going through kind of all their music, and my parents were into them already, and so I kind of started digging in there. That's why when you sent me this album, I was like, I don't know, if I'm familiar with that. But then I saw the album cover. And then I had f flashbacks of it, my dad having the audio cassette of it. And nice. I was like, oh, I was like, okay. Because I got worried when I sent it to you and I was like, have you listened to uh, How Will the Wolf Survive? And you were like, huh? And I was yeah. like, fuck. I was like, well, <laughs> hopefully he listens to this yeah. shit. I just forgot that that was the name of it. But when I saw the album cover, I was like, oh, that one. All right, cool. So you, so you grew up with this in your household. Oh, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Are you from Los Angeles? Yeah, yeah. I was born in LA, in San Fernando. And in then, the San Fernando so, uh, Valley. And then I mostly grew up in Ventura County. 
uh, which is like an hour north. Uh, we moved there when I was young. And then I moved to, you know, San Francisco, San Pancho, we call it. And then I lived there for like 18 years. But now I've been back here for six years. Okay. So so is is a band like Los Lobos, like, are they are they respected in, like, the, the Latin music community? I mean... Yeah, I mean, for sure, man. I would say for sure. There was... I mean, just just based off people I was around, I wouldn't say, even for myself, like when you saw them do, because we fell in love with them because of the La Bamba thing and then the playing, you know, singing in Spanish and stuff like that. And and um, and then you saw them do kind of like the rock thing. And it's like, oh, wait, what? What are they doing here? Like, and then so I think there was a little bit of like, oh, these fools selling out or da da da. But I was like, nah, man, they're just rocking out, dude. And then you, you started listening to it and, and then you appreciated it more and more because it was just because it was a lot of, for me, it was like the first time I saw that, like an all. Latino group yeah. that also sang like corridos and cumbias, but singing like folk music. So our album is number 455 out of 500. It's the second studio album, How Will the Wolf Survive by Los Lobos, released October 1984. Produced, and this is something that, that really shocked me, produced by Steve Berlin, who I didn't know, but this one I knew, T-Bone Burnett. Do you know who T-Bone Burnett oh, is? T-Bone Burnett yeah, yeah, yeah. is one of the most acclaimed uh movie soundtrack producers like ever the guy let's i'm looking at it right now he did all the coen brothers movies so he's did the big one was oh brother where art thou uh yeah. big lebowski cold mountain uh divine secrets of the ya ya sisterhood my favorite movie and crazy heart just a whole bunch of shit and then he's worked adam my producer said he's been out recording i, I knew he went solo or he did solo stuff but just and I think that's kind of what I heard because I, as I was listening to this record, I was like, "Man, this sounds so well produced!" Like oh, yeah. every even when it transitions from from blues into corrado, was it corrado? Corridos, corridos. Yeah. How white do I fucking sound? No, no. <laughs> corrado, Cor- was it a corrado? God damn, God, God damn corridos! <laughs> The fuck they Don't worry, saying. man. My Spanish ain't perfect either, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you can roll that N really good. Oh yeah, then. corridos. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or the, roll the R. There it is, <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah. Corri- I can do. I can do that. I can do that shit. <laughs> fucking, I've lived here twelve years in Los Angeles, but I had no idea. Like, I, I think that's fucking incredible. And then, like, this is a legit record. Rolling Stone magazine ranked this album number thirty in the hundred best albums of the eighties, which just wow. blew my mind. Wow, that's awesome, man. Yeah, I mean, so so like, I, yeah, I, I I just knew it was on the five hundred when you sent it, and then uh, and then I don't know, it was the top thirty in the eighties. Wow. So top thirty for hundred best records of the eighties. I wonder what was before and what's after that too. But but either way, it's like this was really for me an enjoyable experience for you listening to it now. Like, how did how did it? you know, resonate with you. Yeah, man. It, it, I'm so glad that you sent it because once I recognized the album cover, I was like, oh man, my dad had this on audio cassette. And then, you know, re-listening to it, I'm like, I was, I, I definitely would appreciated it more now than I guess I did back then. I probably scrolled through some songs back then or fast forward it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, man, uh, it's so, it's just diverse. It's so, so much variety in it. Yeah. And, uh, and it just appreciated me like, you know, myself and my parents were both born uh, here in the in the LA and LA area, so, um, so you know your, your parents are are they first generation Americans or yeah or? Mike so yeah yeah so my grandfather is from uh, my dad's side is from Mexico you okay. know and then my mom is part Mexican Native American though uh, like her her uh, uncle is um, you know just became chief of our tribe like last October but our reservation is right on the other side of uh, the, the 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 fence for now and might be a wall hopefully not but uh. Of Juarez, Mexico, which is in uh, El Paso, Texas. So yeah. there's an Isleta Pueblo. So everybody's kind of, it's like a Mexican tribe pretty much. You know, they do, some people sp- speak the dialect, but a lot of people speak Spanish and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, but growing up in America. So, uh, all right, let's dive into the record. Let's go okay, into the cool, first cool. track. All right, so first song, uh, Don't Worry Baby. Play the intro for a second. <laughs> How Will the Wolf Survive? Let me tell you guys. By a bunch of Mexicans playing rhythm and blues. That is how (laughs) the wolf is going to expire. This song is incredible. Not not only is it great rhythm and blues, but it shows you how good these guitarists are. So They were the first ones to be like, yeah, fuck it, we're a Latino band. We're from Eastside, but we get, you know, this is what we do. 
And so it's kind of like, it was encouraging, you know? It's like, just be yourself, man. You don't got to worry about being too much of this or too much of that. Just... Yeah, if you want to play fucking rhythm and blues and John Johnny Lee Hooker style blues, you know, guitar, fucking do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can still be Chicano as fuck and fucking play some blues, man. <laughs> no, this is, this is great. All right, so this song is about not letting life get you down. Um, one, so I've known you probably for about two or three years now. Mm-hmm. Uh, every time I see you, you're one of the happiest guys. You just have this really positive energy. Also, you're around very positive people. How do you stay positive in such a negative profession? <laughs> right. I, I mean, for me, man, it's like, you know, obviously depression and anxiety is a motherfucker, but, uh, the, the times that I'm most happy is when I'm around people, especially around my peers too. And like, we all share that common ground of we're trying to go on stage and make people feel good or laugh or whatever it is. But uh, I would say that's when I thrive personality wise the most when I'm around people because I'm just like, ah, yes, you know, energies and we're all going through shit and da da da. But my mom and dad were, they're, they're probably the biggest influence as far as positivity because when I was little, we lived in a one bedroom apartment and, but, you know, but they were always so positive. Yeah. So like the whole like, oh, you know, we don't have that much, we don't have money part, it didn't really. Because they were just like, no, but there's positivity and love. Because we're together. Music, music was a big thing. Like, they were like, you know, Earth, Wind, and Fire, Maze, Frankie Beverly, Brass Construction, you know, Los Lobos, Santana, freaking, you know, Chicago. That There was always music and humor on. And so, and then I saw them grow, and then they, they you know, they achieve all their goals. And positivity was like their religion. And music and humor was like the forefront of that. You know what's you know? funny is that most people that I know that come from homes that are just maybe a little bit tighter with money – you know, so I'm not, I want to. I don't want to say struggling, but just definitely like they like the father and the mother work, and they're or they're taking care. The mom's taking care of kids, and it's just like, you know, I want to buy this, and they're like, no, we can't have that because we can't afford that. Those are some of the happiest families because yeah, they just yeah, come yeah. up with ideas and just just things that are free or whatever, and just being together. It's just there's some of the most positive people I met, and then also some of the richest people I've met are the most negative motherfuckers. <laughs> right, I got right. I got cousins from Long Island that have so much money. And all of them have been in therapy since they were like two. Oh fuck, dude. Yeah, so I mean, it's like it just—I just don't think. God bless your cousins up there listening, right? But you mentioned something that that struck you. He's not listening to this. Jared, are you listening to this? Jared, Lindsay, Zuflack, are you listening? Bobby, are you listening? Michelle, any of you? Give me a sign. Well, I said just like I don't get invited to like their kids' bar mitzvah. I'm like, what? What happened? <laughs> oh, really? You know, remember Los Lobos? Yeah. I'm like, Jesus. Remember Christ. the Carretos? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you mentioned something else. You said you said uh, depression and anxiety. So like, you know, depression is something that I constantly battle. It's like, have you had like a low point in your career where it was really at its peak? For sure. When was that? I, I mean, that's probably ah, uh, I don't know, maybe about. A, year and a half ago a couple years ago or something like that yeah uh it was when things kind of started happening in your uh, career yeah and uh you know not that i'm like this huge thing but you know you go from busting tables and delivering sandwiches and the next thing you know it's like oh i got this much in the bank from doing this and then then all of a sudden everything you know and then you just feel the pressures and and then things are pulling at you and then you feel kind of overwhelmed and then you and then you don't feel like you have the right to complain anybody about it like why am i feeling this way why am i yeah, I should be happy, you know, and then you're like, well, fuck, and, you know, and then you just start having those thoughts, man, and my mind does a good place of taking itself to a dark place right away, which I think we could all relate to. Like, oh, yeah. You know, one minute you're like, hey, no, things are good, and I'm sitting in a room by myself, and I'm like, it would be so easy to leave right now, right? Say, <laughs> yeah, don't want to be. You're just like, maybe I should put on Storage Wars or something to cheer me up. <laughs> Oh, I've been there. Oh, I know, man. It's always when you're at, it's always, because what happens is I think was when you, when you finally start getting everything you want and you still feel the anxiety of just, because it's just being alive. Like everybody yeah. suffers from anxiety and then, and depression is just, you know, was the depression coming from you looking at where you're at, but then still seeing where other people were at and being like, well, I'm not up there. Or is it just, nah, not, not that, anxiety like, I get. It's never. I, I've kind of like at first, and maybe in my first couple years of doing comedy, it was like, you want to go in, I want to be the funniest person on the lineup, da da da. But then when I felt like I started getting better, when I was like, nah, nah, man, it's it's not about that. It's just like, we're all, you know, you start thinking about the whole one life to live thing and fucking da da da. And then it was just like, it's about all of us together and da da da. So I don't look at other comics and try to compete with them at all. I just like trying to do my own thing. But 
when when you reach those points of like, oh man, you know, you picture these things in your head and then you go for it, like work wise and putting the work in. And then once you get it, and then you're supposed, you know, you feel like you're supposed to be happy, and then you're not happy. I think that just feeds into more like into the depression like wait but i'm supposed to be happy why not and then you just fucking you know get dark as fuck and da 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 but i don't know man i'm just getting wordy now and no, not, no. not explaining it no, right no, no. but you're, but, you're uh, explaining it perfectly dude but uh um so how know. did you come out of that situation when all the people are pulling at you and you're in that dark place after getting the success and quitting your jobs like how did you come out of that yeah i, I <clears throat> I would say, and you know, I could be fucking back to rock bottom next year. I don't, I, I don't know. You're not. But, don't worry. But <laughs> you're not. <laughs> Trust me, dude. You're hysterical. You're. But uh, but yeah, I, I, I think it was. You're just, like, what if you were like, uh, you don't know about my crippling gambling addiction? Yeah. <laughs> I'm betting on the horchata. <laughs> <laughs> like what? Are, you bet on drinks? We do sometimes. It's weird. But <laughs> horchatas, micheladas. Is he gonna get the horchata or michelada? I got twenty on it. <laughs> oh shit! Oh shit! It's getting wet burrito. Wet burrito. Where, what does that get me? It's even. Oh thank God, give me money back. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was thinking of just learning to harness it. You know, like be like, hey man, this is what it is, and da da da. And instead of like beating myself up over the small, I'm my mind's always looking for the next thing to beat itself up over, mm-hmm. and then so. And then just, you know, laying off the, the booze and the drugs and, you know, kind of meditating and all that shit. Yes, and, yes. And more just, uh, uh, my, me and my family have always been so tight, but making more of an effort of that, you know, getting on the phone with them and da-da-da. And, and, you know, my, gratefully, uh, grateful my, both my parents are still around. You know, my grandfather still lives, you know, half an hour away from me. And he's 91, still Moses online. I'll go kick it with him and then kind of just focus on the relationships that because i know not everybody has that you know yeah. like i said we started from nothing but now my mom and dad are doing well you know but when we started in that one part i know not everybody has that if you're if you're living in a low-income situation and you're uh, living with a single parent and it, uh, you have all these other things to do it so i just focus on the positive like yeah man fuck we came from this but look yeah all right so cool thing about this song this was used in the 1985 John Hughes teen comedy, Weird Science. I had no idea about that. Did you know that? During the scene where the mob of people show up and rush into the big party. Holy uh, shit. That's Did fucking I nuts. I had no idea. All right, that goes into a matter of time. Now, I think this one is one of the centerpieces of the record. It's upbeat. It's classic R&B music. And because there is a saxophone solo in it, it kind of sounds like Mexican-American Springsteen anthem. Play 148. Now, all right, listen. I didn't want to like this song. I fucking love this song. I thought it was a little cheesy up front. But now I'm like, this, the only word I can use to describe this song is just lovely. Like, it's (laughs) lovely. So here, sample lyrics. And I hope it's all it seems, not another empty dream. There's a time for you and me in a place living happily. Now, this is about an immigrant coming to America for a better life. And uh, I don't think that could be more relevant than right now. Um, in this story, the immigrant and his wife have a conversation about his impending journey to America and the promise of bringing the family once he can establish an opportunity for their new life. Uh, Damn. Yeah, but you could tell this was written in 1984 uh, because if it was written during the Trump era, I think the lyrics <laughs> right. would be a lot different. It'd be like, if we get detained at the border <laughs> in just a matter of time. <laughs> Sent to a concentration camp Just a matter of time, time. <laughs> It's so easy to listen to that song though too Because it's so like kind of chipper Like it is you that- might get away with saying anything You know like We're gonna get over that wall Don't even worry It's like, oh, okay alright cool man it, No it's it's completely It's a completely positive So obviously this like I said It's not what's going down now but you were mentioning your your family's journey to america so you said your parents were born here and you with all the parents before were born out of the country no my my so my dad my mom's father was born on the indian reservation in, in texas yeah you know so which, which is right on the like you can literally see the fence from the reservation in juarez mexico is on the other side which was got a little crazy for a while now it's more chill with the cartel shit. Because <laughs> we used to go over there as kids and like go shopping. And then it was like when the cartel shit started happening, we're like, no, we got to stay over here. Is it that bad? It was bad, dude. Yeah. And uh, but now it's gotten it's gotten better in the last just there, though. I mean, in Mexico, Mexico, it's still a lot of shit going on. But 
uh yeah then my on my dad my dad's uh mom was also born here but his father was born in uh mexico in zacatecas mexico yeah did they have so. a difficult time coming here when they when they chose to yeah 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 like my 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 grandfather tells me story because i'll kind of try to dig in with him but he's 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 also like a positive guy we call him a payaso which is like a clown because he's always joking us that's, that's yeah. where they say i got it from even now he's 91 like he takes like five naps a day but he still gets up and like when he's in the middle of a joke or storytelling he gets up and yeah <laughs> y luego mama's aquí, and he like yeah, and i'm like damn grandpa hey chill out man like you know <laughs> but he gets so into like <laughs> telling a story like, do you have parkinson's because that was very shaky you were just like <laughs> no, no. Hang on, hang on, hang on. <laughs> no that's just him excited about a funny <laughs> part in the story but <laughs> But, uh, yeah, he tells me the stories, you know, his name's Francisco, but he changed his name to Frank legally so he could try, you know, get get a job because it would, he, all those little things would help him, you know. And, uh, you know, he just, he just worked in a factory, I mean, or not that just, but, you know, he, he got an opportunity and did his thing. But, yeah, he, he tells me some crazy stories. It was definitely tough for, you know, immigrants back then, especially, you know, speak English and then, you know, eventually learn how to speak English, you know, it wasn't perfect, but. It's like uh, just hearing those challenges. I'm like, damn, they had to go up against so much. All right. So now this next song is exactly what I was expecting from Los Lobos. Play the intro. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I fucking love this song, dude. I, you know what it is? Not only do I love this music, but I love the accordion. Uh, the Scottish have the bagpipe, the Americans have the guitar, and the Mexicans and Polish have the accordion. The accordion is the Mexican bagpipe. It's the fucking shit. I love this music so much. It's a simply structured musical poetic form developed in Mexico in the 1800s and was sung in common contemporary language. It became very popular along both sides of the border. Now, uh, mm. even though this song sounds so festive, because it does, it's just so much fun. You can't not move when you fucking hear this shit. It's, a, it's really a song about regret and longing. Yeah, um, and I love that they did it in English. This one's in English, right? Well, yeah. Well, this this song actually, I guess, helped me uh, get in touch with the fact, like, how close this is to like pol pol polka, polka, polka. Yeah, you know, like hearing Los Lobos sing a corrido in English, and then you hear the accordion, and that, I'm like, damn, it sounds pretty close to polka, and then it kind of just makes me question, like, dang, like. What are, where, where are the, where's all the origins of this stuff and who got where and, you know, da, da, da. But same with the, like, my, well, my grandfather just turned 91, so we just had his birthday. And there's a, there's a genre of music called tamborazo, which is, it's popular where he's from in Zacatecas, which is all brass. One guy with a drum around his neck, straight up New Orleans style. You know what I mean? And then it's like, oh, dude, what the fuck? So, like, where, where is this originally from? Like, obviously, it came to New Orleans a certain way. It came to Mexico a certain way. Like, I don't know. So... Well, let me ask you this. What are the similarities between Mexicans and Americans? Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, man. Um, it's tough for me to say. I have spent some time in Mexico, you know, but uh, and then just spending time with my grandfather, just seeing him, you know, half his life was in Mexico and then half his life has been here in America. I would think, uh, I mean, there's definitely more opportunity here, I would say. And there's a big separation, though, in Mexico of like the class. You know, like so the rich are extremely rich and the poor are extremely poor. Exactly. Yeah. At, whereas here, uh, you know, even though we have our stuck up rich people, there are a lot of very affluent rich people who, you know, we all kind of mix together, whether it be through a festival or just places to eat or whatever the fuck, you know, da da da. But in Mexico, it's like if you're a school teacher trying to go to like a club downtown, like they're not going to let you in. And it's like, you know, and I've been in those situations where I had a a friend who was a school teacher lived in Mexico and we're trying to go to a club and we're like, you know, we're not even wearing that ball and stuff, but they could tell right away, like who's American, who's not. And they'll be like, Hey, we can't let this guy in. And I'm turning to him. What? And then he explains to me in Spanish, you know, like, Hey, this is how it is down here. So I had to give the guy, like, the, the bouncer guy, like an extra 40 bucks or something. And he's all right, you know, pasale, you know, just like, get him in. And I'm like, damn, that's messed up. Like, I don't even live here. This homie lives down the street and you can't let him in. <laughs> <laughs> and we were the same color, you know, like the yeah. same shade of brown, but they could just, you know, they could just tell. And I feel like, I don't know. I feel like uh, there's more. I mean, now obviously it's changing with the whole administration we have. I feel like those kind of feelings are, 
you know, kind of coming into our turf now. And it used to just be like, nah, it's all good. Like, whatever, you know, as long as you're not about some bullshit. But have you, since the Trump era, have you, have you dealt with a lot more, like, hatred or, or anything like that? Have you had an instance where you really felt it? I, oh, man, definitely. Because you're traveling a lot, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely a lot of, you know, you know, I've had my times of discouragement and also times of encouragement. You know what I mean? And, you know, I did a show, you know, because it's only been with the la- within the last year, year and a half that clubs are giving me my own weekends, you know, like headlining, you know, and I do, I do myself and my characters live, you know, and I do, you know, Creeper, it was a, it was a Cholo, not everybody knows what a Cholo is. And then I do Juanita Carmelita, who's, you know, a female character. So that's me, you know, I'm rocking wedges and lipstick and shit. And then so, you know, I'll go to like, you know, Indiana or whatever. And I'm like, fuck, man. And then uh, I'll, I'll never forget this. It was a dude wearing a Trump shirt in the audience. And even my my host, Rudy Ortiz, another Mexican, he came up to me and goes, hey, man, there's a guy wearing a Trump shirt out there. We thought he was there to, like, start shit. Really? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, yeah, but he, he ends up staying after for, like, the meet and greet. It was like, oh, man, you fucking funny. Man, you're though. funny as shit. Yeah. I thought you were going to be terrible. Yeah. Trump told me Mexicans <laughs> are bad. So it's like, fuck, <laughs> man. It's kind of like, fuck you, but still, ah, oh, man, we found a common ground, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Well, funny's funny. And, and I mean, if you can, you know, what, what you're doing up there is hysterical, so... I'm just surprised. Like he was probably sat down. He was like, "Oh shit, this this dude's a Mexican." All right, well I shouldn't walk out yet. Wait, he's a funny one. He's one of the good ones. And yeah. then he, what a dumb fuck. Yeah. What if you're like friends with him now and, and he oh, hears man. this? Well, I was like, nervous. He was thinking like I'm making fun of my own people, you know, which is like, like or like, oh yeah, yeah, all Mexicans are. And, but but he said some stuff to me at the end. I was like, oh, actually, fuck, you get it. He might not be a terrible person. You're just clueless on what the fuck's going on, you know? I don't know. Most most but, of those people that that have ra- that are racist, that's that's what they just have no idea. Yeah, they're just clueless, man. Yeah. And it's like sometimes you can't hold it against them, but also it's like, come on, man, get your shit together. But this whole Trump thing has definitely made me just the hatred. Involved. I'm not saying every Trump supporter has, you know, is full of hate, but there's he has a, there's some hatred in his agenda for sure, and it's like makes me relive the the shit, you know. Like I've been spit on, kicked out of places because of my race in California, and some some white friends are surprised by that. Wait, no, but you live in California, yeah. Fuck, I know. All right, and it still happened, you know. It's just like, and it's still happening, and it's probably yeah. happening even more to like younger, you know, sure, you know, minorities or whatever, but. Yeah, yeah, just just make me re- relive all those those moments at, at growing up where, you know, I was either removed, like asked to leave places, or fucking kicked out of parties, or fucking da da da, like trying to trying to fit in with other groups, you know, and then just being like, nah, bro, this ain't for you, you know what I mean? And so, you know, I guess that's why I love comedy so much because you could be like, fuck all that shit, you yep. know, and then it's like, but um, but yeah, man, it, it's a shame, man, the hate, and then, uh, and then you know, my grand my grandfather came back from serving in like. Vietnam and he was in uniform maybe he's like in I think he was in like I forget where he was Kentucky or something they're just going to a bar he's with this guy and he gets spit on because he's Native American and I'm just like gosh damn like you just came back for protect- haven't they done <laughs> enough to Native Americans <laughs> let one of them have a fucking drink I know, Good dude. It's God. Like, and he was in uniform bro in like uni- mili- US military uniform dedicated his whole life to the military <laughs> he was like what are you army I only like navies <laughs> you're like Jesus <laughs> Christ. All right, let's bring it to the next song. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Let's go to the next no, one. No, no, no. I love it. I love this. I love this, please. All right, our last night. Now, this is where I really knew I liked the record. Also, I realized that the lead singer, David Hildago, could really sing. Uh, play a little bit of it for me, Peter. I was fucking dancing my ass off to this. Just it just swings. It's just a fun song, and it once again you got this upbeat music, but it's another sad yeah, song. Sad, dude. Sad about an impending breakup where the music is just too happy to feel bad about it. Like you don't even know that's what he's singing right. about. Um, I loved this song. Your thoughts? Yes, I, I I loved it. I, I I had to listen to it like a few times to be like, because I was like, oh cool. And then I was thinking, oh, they're like on vacation on a trip together, and they met each other out there, but they all got to They live in different parts. And then I started listening more. I'm like, no, they like been in a relationship, but they realize that it's not gonna work out. Yeah. And this is this is it, man. And I was like, gosh damn, just the layers in it, you know, because 
you don't really you don't really feel it until you listen to the words because you're you know like you said I was oh. dancing to it too I'm like oh this will feel good I'm gonna roll down the windows it's and like, light a joint I'm cruising I feel I'm like oh shit wait um, <laughs> this guy's about to get his heart broken <laughs> it's just again, they could have been singing like syphilis yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. on your dick yeah, yeah. but when you go to the doctor you <laughs> then find out you're really sick <laughs> oh, fuck. Next song, The Breakdown. I didn't really like this one. I skipped this one after a few listens. Uh, just here, it does have this really good sax solo in it, but the, there's this clapping. Here, just play 207 real quick. So I, like, I love a good sax solo, but that clapping in the background just sucks balls <laughs> like it's just terrible all right the next song uh i got loaded uh i really liked this one um this is a cover of camille bob's 1965 single released by his band little bob and the lollipops what i love about this band they have a sax player and they fucking use him <laughs> There is nothing better than a good sax solo. I'm telling you, I think every song on here has had one. So that's why now Los Lobos <laughs> is my favorite band of all time. Uh, but this is a song about just getting fucked up. Hence the title, I Got Loaded. Yeah. Um, what's the wildest thing you ever did while loaded? Oh, man. Oh, I don't even know, man. I, I need time to think about that one. But shit. I ran... I, I ran like kind of naked through a mall one time. What? Like I I, got, I had basketball shorts. How could you not that? You should have had that answer immediately. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I've done some shit, man. But uh, yeah, 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 explain yeah. the situation. I, I just it was like a, oh my friends like, oh you know daring me to do it. We were doing some day drinking and I had like these like basketball shorts on and I took everything off but those but I rolled them up into like a thong. Yeah. You know, basketball shorts you can kind of roll them up. Yeah. Put them in, cr put them in the crack of my ass and all that. And then just kind of, first I was just kind of like walking just like through the mall and then they were just like, you know, my friend had a, this was back in like camcorder days, you know, the little thing and they yeah, just, just filmed me walking through the mall and then I started running just you know, people's reactions. I mean, I wasn't that crazy. Then I, from the running, I threw up outside after, not in the mall, but <laughs> threw up in the parking lot. How but you know, that I was like you 17, up? 16, 17. I didn't think shit. you were fucking 30, dude. <laughs> it's last week. I was at the, the Grove and, uh, <laughs> I, I just, I just like, how great would it have been if you would have had the rolled up basketball shorts thong and then you threw up <laughs> like in the mall. Uh, that's it. That would have made it even better, man. You said you don't drink uh, as much as you used to. Oh, like, no. You, I, do you yeah. drink? So you still drink? You quit? Uh, no, I, I still drink. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it's a battle. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're one of my inspirations, actually. To, <laughs> to, to quit drinking? To, well, yeah, I don't know if I can quit, you know, but I do like... I do uh, take my breaks, but I always, you know, it's like when I hit, when I feel my, my body tells me when, you know, and I'm like, oh, fuck, you know, da, da, da. all right, lay off this, lay off that. I'll take like a week off, you know, and sometimes it's tougher than others. Sometimes it's easy. Yeah. Especially but, if there's things going on with friends and they're like, hey, we're going to this thing. And you're oh, like, man, well, you know how it is being a comic and we're around it all the time. Yeah. It's in our face all the time. It's just like there is like, well, first of all, let me ask you, any DUIs? Yes, I got one. You got uh, one? Mm -hmm. I got three, dude. Step your game up. Yeah, I got it dropped to a wet and reckless. So a wet uh, and reckless? Is yeah. that what it's called? It yeah, was yeah. That, it's my favorite porno yeah. movie. I, <laughs> wet, and wet and reckless. Wet reckless, volume twenty nine. <laughs> <laughs> um, good for you, man. Like, there's there's nothing wrong with recognizing uh, where you're at and being able to take a break. I always say this: you can do drugs, you can drink, but if it starts fucking with your money. You got to cut it loose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, and that's yeah, it. And you're in a really, really good position right now. Like, dude, I only see you fucking going like that. So it's just, and if it's getting in the way of you creating, you know, and, and making you a worse artist than you are and taking away that special thing that you have, that's when, and if you can at least see that, you know right. what I mean? Like, that's so important because there's some people that, that are far talented than both of us that never saw that and, you know, don't have careers because of that oh, or are man. dead. I, I you know, know what I mean? And I hate seeing that. You're on the up. If the circle starts going, starts going down, that's when you take your break. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Dude, have fun. 
for me, please, God, because I can't. <laughs> uh, I'm bored. I want to, God, I'm like, yeah, yeah. Anyways, in the news, it's nonstop talk about fentanyl. And I'm like, oh, man, those were good days. But, <laughs> they're like, no, Josh, but they're talking about all these overdoses and deaths. And I'm like, yeah, but, you know, it was <laughs> yeah, a lot but... of fun. A lot of fun. Um, all right. Speaking of fun <laughs> and fentanyl, the we're next song <laughs> is Serenata Norteña. Norteña. Yeah. And uh, we're back with the mariachi shit. And in a shocker, <laughs> Serenata Norteña translates to Northern Serenade. Yeah. I fucking loved this song. Like, I, we were talking about it earlier about how much I just like the, the vibe of it. I love the feeling uh, as it comes to this uh, mariachi, if, if that's what you call it, music. Um, it's just so good. But what I love the most about this is when that goes from verse to the chorus, that shit just drops. And I and also that guy goes, ay, 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 and I fucking love that. Play when that shit drops at 2, 218. Yeah, they slow it down like that. Oh. Yeah, dude. Dude, they fucking slow it down, and I mean that's that is a fucking like a drop. Dude, I love this song though because uh, you know, and still how it is in some parts of Mexico, especially like the smaller villages that don't, you know, like where, you know, social media and this and that is like a thing. Is like, uh, even my grandfather would tell me stories like when you liked a girl, you would wait till the night falls and you would have to hire like band members to go serenade the girl, and a lot of times the the guy would go ask the father permission first to give him a heads up. Like, Hey, I'm gonna come through tonight. And then, you know, the father would approve it. And then they would, you come with these like, you know, three or four band members. And then you start serenading the girl from outside her home. And then if she turns on her light, that means it, she's it's yes. If she leaves the light off. You fuck. That means now, nah, homie, you gotta, you gotta work on your skills or she just, <laughs> maybe the lights ugly. broke. Yeah. <laughs> Nah, man, they poured. The light's broken. Trust me, I'm gonna keep singing. Hello, <laughs> la Santa, bitch. Is that is nothing? Go, right. bring, go give her a candle just in case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, she's got the lighter out like it's at a concert. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> no, that's that's incredible. I had no idea about that. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy, right? So, uh, yeah, yeah, kind of, kind of reminded me of that. The next song on the record is Evangeline. Now, this is a swinging, upbeat boogie about a young Chicana girl who runs away from home to find something more. In 2012, this song and many others from the Los Lobos songbook were used to create a multimedia stage musical called Evangeline, the Queen of Make-Believe that actually ran at the Bootleg Theater here in Los Angeles. Oh, wow. And, yeah, and I see why... They did this, and they named it after this because this song is fucking great. Play a little bit of it uh, for me, Peter. Don't know where she is or where she's going. She is the queen of make-believe, Evangeline. So the story of Angeline is a, a youthful Chicano uh, growing up in the late 60s, mostly an optimistic albeit naive teenage girl who leaves home in search for her American dream. Evangeline is on the roam, just barely 17 when she left home. Don't know where she is or where she's going. She's the queen to make believe, Evangeline. Uh, no, that's great because I think that's kind of what we're all trying to do is we're all in search of our American dream. Mm -hmm. um, what is the stupidest thing you ever did as a teenager? Ah, oh, shit, man. I don't know. I guess uh, uh, I, I try to be, I, you know, I try to be a cholo. I guess it's probably the stupidest thing I did because I got my ass beat. <laughs> Tell me about it. Uh, I was like trying to, you know, I was in a, you know, like a lot of us go through identity crisis kind of thing. I was like 12, 13, and all my cousins were like cholos, you know, they're like gang members and shit. And so, you know, after school, I go to my, gr my, my grandma and grandpa's house every day. That's where we would all hang out, including my other cousins who were just maybe a couple years older than me or two, three years older than me. So, you know, I'm 12. They're like 15. And, you know, I want to be down with them. I want to hang out. And then so I'm like trying to dress up like them. And then my mom's like, you ain't dressing like that. My dad's like, nah, nah. Because my dad's old school cholo. You know, he's like, nah, nah, let him, let him. You know, but if he's going to do it, he's going to do it right. And then so my dad would wake me up at like 5 a.m. He would make me crease my dickies, 
like starch them, crease my shirt, my white tee, starch them, tuck it in, you know, he, he, you know, like be all like, and he's like, all right, you want to do it? Then go out there and do it. You know, you want to rep the shit. I would say it was like about a month in and these two dudes hit me up and I was like, yeah, you know, I was trying to claim the same gang my cousins were from and all that shit. And, uh, you know, and they slammed my head against a metal door and I got a dent. I still got a dent in my skull right here. And I got 12 staples in my head right here. I don't know if you can see it. I got a dent it, in my skull too, back yeah. here. <laughs> Fuck yeah, we're the dented skull boys. Yeah, yeah. The brothers. We got dent skull brothers. <laughs> so, yeah, so after that happened, I was like, ah, you know what? <laughs> Let's go back to just being Frankie. Yeah, bugle, bugle boy shorts and a car cargo. Jeans. You're like, I don't have to be called the Rooster <laughs> anymore. I don't need a nickname. <laughs> but uh, I was probably, I'll probably say that was a stupid, but but a great learning experience, and I'm glad that I'm almost grateful that it happened because it could have been worse, you know. And then, uh, oh yeah, let's say you never that never happens, and you actually get into the gang, and or you just go try to keep trying to fit in, and you're in that life. I yeah, mean, my and my, you know, my cousins were always involved in that still kind of are but even they kind of they were always kind of like this ain't for you homie you know like there's something better for you out there they would always tell me stick to the books all right stick to the books all right because they saw that my mom and dad were like working hard to put me on the different path even though they would they would beat my ass themselves sometimes like i appreciated it but uh but yeah 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 i was like you know i think it, it put me put me in the right direction but also i guess doing that stupid thing Help help me isn't get my fun- head straight. Yeah, but isn't it funny that one of your most popular characters? <laughs> yeah, yeah, is that is that, and it's like yeah, yeah. so you do in a sense get to live that out still. Oh yeah, uh, and a lot safer and a oh, lot yeah. more money than probably yeah. the other motherfuckers <laughs> yeah. are making. Well, maybe that's some of it, but uh, but yeah, yeah, it's a uh, and he, and Creepers like oh, he's a fitness instructor, you know, so he's positive and yeah, it, it's straight up like my dad, man. My dad is like. He's uh, when he had kids, it's what like totally changed. But he was always like in a lowrider car club. Like my my Nino, my godfather, his best friend, yeah. was like president of lowrider car club for like thirty years. So I was you know being at lowrider car shows, like you see rival gang members sharing the same space, but they they would leave the drama outside of that because it's all about the cars, you know. So you see that like wow, it's just like having something positive to focus on could change the whole vibe, you know. So it's like. I even talk about it. It's like they're like, "Oh yeah, check out my ride." All right, see you later. Well, hopefully I don't see you later because then we'll have to fight. But right now, just like, hey. All right, next song. Uh, I got to let you know. Uh, really fun song. Uh, I did love the tempo of this. Uh, play the intro real quick. It's, what I heard from this was it sounded like a sped up version of uh, something from the Coasters from the 1960s, just like an older band, right, uh, right. but with a little bit of like Latin flavor and some of the Zydeco accordion that I love so much. Lyrically, it's pretty much just an I love you, baby song. Uh, not much as far as depth. So that brings us then to one of the oddest songs that I think is on this record, Lil King of Everything. Uh, it's very old timey and, and just like the only way to explain it is renaissance play, uh, the intro, Peter. What was the Renaissance like in Mexico? <laughs> like, Dude, I have no come idea. hither, Enrique, <laughs> and see this clay sculpture. Some horchata, Enrique. <laughs> Forsooth, Rodrigo, <laughs> never shall your wench's guacamole be outdoneth. <laughs> like, it's fucking... <laughs> it just didn't feel like it should be on this record. And, like, it's... Oh, listen, I, I, I'm not saying I didn't like the song. It's a great song. It's just out of all the shit we've been going through for the first... 10 well the first nine songs prior just didn't fit with the record now we've come to the title track of the album will the wolf survive uh not only is it the title track like i just said but it's also the last song on the record not my favorite good song Mm -hmm. but i don't know if this is the way i wanted the album to end uh peter play 243 for me it's the truth Actually, I want to take that back. I like this song. I do like it a lot. It's good, man. I, I can't shit on it. It's it's fucking good. Like it's it really is a it's like a fun song. It's it sounds a little dated, but I still feel like it, it's you know it's a strong strong song. 
Yeah, yeah. I like it. Feels it, it feels familiar to me, you know, like yes, uh, other songs. Yeah, it sounds like it should be in like a montage of some guys like hiking. Yeah, yeah, or like a family in a station wagon going camping in that windy road, like. Well, the world, yeah. <laughs> and they're passing like snacks, but down yeah. there, they're eating cheese its and shit. So the inspiration for this song, as well as the title of the album, was a National Geographic article titled "Where Can the Wolf Survive." It paralleled the band's struggles to find musical acceptance. According to drummer mm. Louis Perez, it was like our group, our story. What is the beast, this animal that the record companies can't figure out? Will we be given the opportunity to make it or not? Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because you know you figure these guys, like they struggled. From what I, I did some reading prior to this about them and they struggled. Like they made their first record, which they made enough money off their first record to buy a van and tour. And that's where they constructed this. So they wrote this while they're in that van. So that's how I see it all. Now, now even wow. hearing that story and listening to the song and seeing like the title of it, mm -hmm. like it just makes me appreciate this band even more right. and appreciate this song. Um, do you feel like you're accepted in your career i mean <clears throat> yeah yeah i would say i mean there's always like you know the the two sides you know and then even for my own community latino community you know i get people that are like oh you know he's feeding into this is a bad look for us or da 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 but it's like come on man uh it's that gets a little frustrating for me especially in the beginning you know when you're when you're like barely working your way up and nobody knows who you are da 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 like it, you know, nobody's saying anything about it, it but all of a yeah. sudden it gets big and obviously, you know, people say some negative stuff and, and it hurts, but it's also like, I've learned to like, just focus on the positive because 99% of the feedback is good because it's relatable or, you know, Creeper is like the most popular, but I love, I love doing Creeper because it's so nostalgic for me, you know, and like I'm doing a piece of my dad, my godfather, my cousins, like the things I grew up around. So I'm like, hell yeah. So when I see people connect with that, I'm like, you know, and he's not like, too over the top and he's a positive dude so it's like all right cool well you know, what so. was the first moment was that was was when creeper dropped was that the first moment that you felt like felt accepted um i mean i still sometimes i feel not accepted you know so like now you know so it's like i don't know if that's ever going to end but but uh you know i would say once i was able to just make a living and do shows and start touring and you know, uh, is that when you you felt like you've ex you accepted it that you're actually like no I'm a part of this machine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I was like no nah, I'm not gonna change anything because this and that. Like I, I you know I'm the, yeah okay if it offends some people it offends some people that's just the way it is. I mean and comedy nowadays especially in the the world we're living in today is like everything's kind of like you know like oh shit don't say that or don't say this. So me doing a, a cholo character like based off whatever even my female character Juanita Carmelita is like. Dude, these are just characters, these are just jokes, and this is just a reflection of my family and things I grew up around. So it's like, if you can't see that, then, you know, you can just keep it moving. You want to do some facts and then we'll get out of here? Sure, sure do whatever, some facts. Yeah. Uh, with the facts, the facts, the facts, facts and facts and facts, will the facts survive? <laughs> In 1980, former Sex Pistol Johnny Lydon's new band, Public Image Limited, uh, which we, we actually just broke that down um, with Kyle Kinane. It was a terrible record. Uh, in 1980, <laughs> former Sex Pistol Johnny Lydon's new band, PIL, were to play a show at the Grand Olympic Auditorium in downtown LA with several opening bands. When the band, the 45s, dropped out, Los Lobos filled in unannounced. One attendant oh. was music journalist... Chris Morris, future author of the only story of the band in print, Los Lobos, Blue and Dream. His plus one that night was future producer and Los Lobos member, Steve Berlin. Oh, fuck yeah, dude. Good for them. Whoa. Chris recalled that the band were still mostly unknown East L.A. acoustic folk act, and they were then <laughs> pelted by beer and other things by their first punk rock audience, they lasted about nine minutes on stage. Oh, my God. That is fucking insane to think about. Yeah, just getting. I mean, I, I once was at a rave doing stand-up comedy. People started throwing glow sticks and beer at me, which was oh, fine. Shit. 
Because well, the glow sticks were cool. The beer, like, because you can you could see the glow stick coming, but the beer would. <laughs> you never saw that one. What's the worst show you ever played? Oh gosh, it was a <clears throat> comedy club in uh, Pleasanton, California. Tommy T's and uh, oh, I've it, heard of that. It's yeah, wild. It was a uh, it was a Sunday show. The headliner that was there the whole weekend had a disagreement with with the the owner of the club on the Saturday night after the second show. So but so he was supposed to close the one last show, but he left, you know, he got in an argument. So they had a they filled in with like a showcase. And it was his dude's birthday from East Oakland. And you know, he got this gator skin shoes doing it up. Seemed like a really cool dude, but it, the the whole crowd was packed. I mean, and, and it, you know, and they were an East Oak, Oakland hood crowd and hey, but it but it, you know, uh, I started it uh, up in the bay so yeah, I was a, I was, a, I was confident, you know, because I started in a lot of, you know, uh, it's your area, Latino it's rooms. Your, yeah, I started a lot know. of black rooms. I did rooms in like Richmond, where it's just all black hood crowd, and like that's how I started. So I was like, you know, I was like, all right, I got this, I got this. And then uh, they were, they did this showcase, and right when I got there, the host Sugar Shay, she was like, oh baby, you know, they're being rough and da da da. And I was like, but I was still like, I, I got this. Oh, you know? chill out, Sugar Shay. Like, I got you, girl. Yeah, yeah. It was Sugar like, Shay. I love that name. I was like a few years in, or I think maybe three or four years in. So I was kind of still like, oh man, yeah, I'm killing it. Da, da, I'll da. get him. And I go back to the bar and order a drink. She's like, yeah, they're sending drinks back. Da, da, da. And I was like, nah, I got this. You know, the show looked like it was going okay. And then I went up and I had him for like the first 10 minutes. And I used to do this bit back in the day, you know, and I stopped, what was <laughs> stopped it doing it. It was, it was like about a, a gay gangster hip hop group. I'm like, what are those? Like a, a, gay, a gay gangster hip hop group. But they were like dope and people were feeling them. And I had like four members and I had verses written out for each one and voices for each one. <laughs> so stupid. But I would do them in these rooms, man. And a lot of times they would hit, but it was like all Latino or all black rooms, you know, with, with you know, they get homophobic or they very, say it's a yeah. very risky joke. And sure enough, man, I did this joke. This crowd was not feeling it. I mean, they, like, crossed their arms, turned on me. And after that, like, I couldn't get him back, man. I turned into a robot just trying to get through my jokes. This dude stood up out of his chair, <laughs> stood up, and he's like, motherfucker, you ain't funny. And then it just sits back down. And I'm just like, <laughs> oh, okay. And then I just go to the next joke. And then these two nice-looking black women up front, they look like they were just sweet, like, you know, cook, cook a nice meal for you or whatever. They're sitting up front <laughs> and out loud so everybody could hear because it was that quiet. You know, they're like, oh, baby, you look scared. You look uh -huh. scared. And I'm just like, uh -huh. Yeah, okay. Next joke. <laughs> Go to the thing. Dude, I was dying inside, man. Then I had the nerve to hang out after the show. Oh. Dude comes up to me, my boy G King standing next to me. And this dude comes up. He's like, tells you, King, you should have stayed up there. Dude looks at me, he goes, practice, practice. And then just walks away. And I was like, oh, all right, thanks, man. Thanks for coming out. And just like, oh, dude. It, it was like rough for me to get on stage for like the next month. You know, I called every veteran oh, yeah. I knew. I'm like, here's what happened. They're like, hey, man. It's got to happen. It you know, has to happen. No, that's the best advice. Because, I mean, <laughs> I'm gonna, dude, I would have quit in the first year because I had a bad experiences where I would turn an audience off or they just, it would just be awkwardly quiet. And I was scared. But yeah. that's the thing is that, like, it's those shows that just, they, anytime you get take a loss like that, as long as you learn from it, so now you know, it's like, all right, well, if I'm doing another like all black room or just like or there's a lot of guys like do not do that joke you know but i mean yeah. at the same time fuck them like you should be able to do that joke joke's fucking funny <laughs> yeah 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 i mean there's times that i did it did it but i appreciate those rooms like that too you know it's just like the honesty you know like nah nah okay that was funny okay it's like <laughs> all right cool you know it's just like <laughs> but I love that shit, man. But uh, but yeah, yeah. I would say I take a piece of that set with me on stage every time. Every now. time, just nah. To, that, just good. to you know, ah, good. It's a, it's a, it's an extra muscle. Good. You know you're mean? a stronger yeah. person. You're a better comic for it. So <laughs> fuck yeah. What's up, Sugar Shay? Uh, <laughs> all right, and now this fact is fucking insane. In 1986, at the urging of their shared record label, Warner Brothers, Los Lobos entered a studio to help Paul Simon work on his new album. After a fruitless first day, the band played Simon a new instrumental track from their next album. He took a liking to it, and they recorded it. However, when the record came out, it listed Paul Simon as the sole composer of the track, all Around the World, or Myth of the Fingerprints. The record was the award-winning Graceland, and it sold 14 to 16 million records to date. This is where I, I think this is fucked. 
When the band contacted Paul Simon about getting a co-writing credit and share of the money, he told them, and I quote, try and sue me. Oh, play the song real quick. Play the song. Cause let's hear all around the world in the myth of the fingerprints. I mean, that sounds exactly like three tracks off this record. <laughs> right. Dude, fuck Paul Simon. <laughs> Fucking Paul Simon, man. You what fuck. A dick, dude. Understandably, the band thinks he's an asshole. You ever get ripped off? Jesus. I mean, you know, I've had, yeah, you know, I've had people tell me, or even the video thing, especially with like Creeper and stuff like that, I've had some. You know, yeah, yeah. Some video my character's feed. Cleeper, little peeper. I peep, <laughs> I peep over walls, and it gets a workout like that. <laughs> it doesn't even have to be. It doesn't even have to be comedy wise. Have you ever been ripped off in your life? Oh, you mean like robbed? It like, could be anything. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, dude. I've had my apartment robbed. I've had fucking car car broken into, like shit like that. Yeah. What was the word? What's one stuff? I've been robbed mud? like. Uh, a dude with a gun. He didn't point it at me, but he showed it to me, you know. And then, but uh, I would say getting getting my apartment raw, man, it was fucking. What was that? It was fucked up. Um, be like two thousand five. I mean, they just like cleaned me out, and it was just like everything. Even like my little, I had like these clippers I used to shave my balls with, and everything. They even took that. I'm like, fuck, man. <laughs> Dick trimmer? Yeah, yeah. They took my dick trimmer, bro. They took your dick trimmer? <laughs> what the fuck? Dude, those are that? some good robbers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you, you know there was a minute when they were like throwing shit in the bag. They were like, yo, should I get his ball clippers? Yeah, yeah. How do you know there was ball clippers? It could be his face clippers. Motherfucker, we know when the ball clippers. Look at that hair right there. That's all curly cue. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like it's from uh, fucking Abe Vigoda's head. Uh, all right. Final thoughts on the record. Oh, man, love it. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a few tracks on there. I'm probably not going to listen to again, but but uh, <laughs> but uh, overall, I love it because I just love how they show their versatility on it. And uh, they were weren't afraid to commit, you know, because like when you talk about the struggles they had and becoming who they are, like I can totally see that. I felt that as a listener, you know, and I'm like, oh, we got to buy their album. And I'm like, what's all this other polka shit they got going on here? Yeah. This bluesy folk stuff. But then. After you listen to it and then you start embracing their voice, you're like, oh, shit, okay, these guys are just dope as fuck, you yeah. know? And now, also, I'm like, fuck Paul Simon, man, damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fuck Paul Simon. Take right, I hope away. he made it right. If, you know? if you take any takeaway facts from this record <laughs> and feelings, it's fuck Paul Simon. Uh, Frankie, I, I, I love watching the shit that you're doing, and I love watching you rise, man. You're so funny, and I can't thank you enough for coming on, brother. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me, man. Much continued success and much love, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed that conversation with Frankie. Really enjoyed that, guys. I hope you guys did too. For all things Frankie Quinones, go to his website, frankiequinones.com, and check out his social media at Frankie Quinones, where you can see all the incredible funny videos that that guy posts. Also, I'm going to be posting Frankie's Spotify mixtape on our website and on Soch, and you can find all things 500 at our website, the500podcast.com. Email me at 500podcasts at gmail.com. Tell me if you think this episode was awesome. If you think it sucked, still email us. Follow me at Josh Adam Myers on all social media and all tickets you can find at joshadammyers.com. Please subscribe on Spotify or your favorite platform, but subscribe on Spotify. And if you are listening to this on Apple, boo, leave a review. Boo, leave a review. Don't forget to follow my staff at Avery Funny, at DJ Morty Coyle, at JT Podcast Exec, at Badass Wizard, at Real Matt Pinfield. Now, we just listened to Los Lobos from 1984. For new music this week, our music director Matt Pinfield selected Goodbye June. Goodbye June are a three-piece band from Nashville who were inspired by Americana influences like the Black Crows and Los Lobos. 
The band is touring Europe right now where they have built a strong following after the last few tours. Listen to their track Anywhere the Wind Blows on Spotify and check out the link on our website, the500podcast.com. We're going to get you to come to the website. One way or another, you get in there. And if you're in a band and were directly influenced by one of these albums or artists and you want your music featured on the 500 website, send your song to 500 podcast at gmail.com. Make sure you put the album and the artist that influenced you in the subject line. And if you guys are in a band and you want your song played on the 500, send us that with the release saying that we can play your song. And we will play a little bit of it and post it on our website because I want to launch bands. This is for all of y'all. If you're out there and you want to get heard, I am here to help. Send us your music. Let's launch some careers. Next week is Alice Cooper week with his 1971 album, Love It to Death. So you got some homework to do. Listen to the album on Spotify. Stay fleecy.